we're down to the final presentation. So <clears throat> this is pretty Nebraska, Nebraska specific. So if you're not from Nebraska, this the first part of this presentation might be kind of uh, uh, not useful for you. Um, but for those of you here in Nebraska, um, it's pretty pretty pertinent. So. So we'll talk about just the state fire regulations uh, here in Nebraska, and then talk about preparing a burn plan really quick, quick, quickly, and then uh, chat just a little bit about programs. So here in Nebraska, prescribed fire is regulated by state legislature. Uh, there are several statutes that pertain directly to fire. So essentially, there shall be an open statewide burning ban on all bonfires, rubbish fires, and fires for the purpose of clearing land, which would apply to prescribed fire. That means essentially that no fire can happen on the ground without the local permission from the local fire district and fire chief, in which they may waive this burn ban. So in order to get that waiver, you need to write a burn plan and get a burn permit from the local fire chief. And here's what that burn permit looks like here on this side. Uh, you should also notify the fire chief prior to starting the burn. Many fire chiefs consider you getting the burn permit as notification of, uh, of notifying them prior to starting the burn. Work with your local fire chief. They have uh, local you know, guidelines. Sometimes they wanna be called uh, you know, right before you burn, just so they know. If you violate, if you burn without a burn permit, you can be charged with a class four misdemeanor and fined up to $500, potentially. So a permit for uh, burning can be issued if it complies with 815.2005, which is essentially you must submit an application for a permit through a burn plan process. Now, that burn plan process is outlined in 81.520.05, which we can talk about. And the fire chief will evaluate this plan and determine its compliance. And if it complies with everything in that statute um, and the, burn, uh, the fire chief thinks that it will be burned with due regard for safety and property, um, they can issue a burn permit. Now this burn permit can only be issued for up to 30 days. Some fire chiefs will only issue a burn permit for the day, and some will issue it for up to 30 days. So when you're writing a burn plan, um, according to state statute, these are the things that must be in it. And, and to be honest with you, writing a burn plan that, that meets statutory requirements is, is really easy. It can, it can be done on like two pages of paper, blank pieces of paper, and written down. Luckily, we have templates that are available for people to use um, to write these burn plans. But here's the things that need to be on them. The name of the landowner of the land in which to be burned, the name of the person who's gonna supervise it if it's different than the landowner, the land management objective to be accomplished. So that could be, you know, kill cedar trees or, you know, burn off my grass, um, whatever that objective may be. Then you also need a map showing the areas to be burned, including natural and man-made fire breaks. So you basically need a map showing, okay, here's, here's the area I'm gonna burn and here are the fire breaks I'm gonna be using. That's all you need on the map there. Procedures to be used to confine the fire in the boundary without pre-existing fire breaks. So basically you would write in there, um, you know, we're gonna be using a, a wet line on a mode fire break to confine this in the boundary or maybe you know a dist fire break or something. And then you also need a list of equipment that will be on hand. So what how many pumpers do you need? You know, how many flappers, how many drip torches, all that stuff. And then you also need to identify on the map uh, the types and conditions of the vegetation to be burned on the on the land and in adjacent areas. So not only on your property but the surrounding property as well. And and we define that as immediately touching uh, the property is what we use as a standard. 
And then also identification of any roads or um, homes that may be affected by smoke. So you can look at downwind, say you're gonna burn with a southwest wind like this, you can sell that, you know, you're gonna be burning right into town with a bunch of houses. So obviously you wouldn't wanna burn in this situation. Then on that burn plan, you also need to put a description of your weather conditions that you think is gonna be safe to burn. So this needs to include at least a minimum of wind speed and direction, temperature, and relative humidity. And that is essentially all that is required for state statute, which is really simple. But then they also throw in this other caveat of how government works. You know, in case we forgot something, such any other information that may be prescribed by the fire chief or local fire department. And this could li literally mean anything. I mean, some fire chiefs want, you know, on specific burn plans or templates. So my recommendation is always to reach out to your local fire chief to ask whether there are any certain conditions that you need to do before submitting that application, that burn plan. That way you don't have to rewrite it if something was wrong with it. Now, when we write our burn plans, we typically go above and beyond what's above what's required in state statute. So we add additional things like we put in our crew assignments. Uh, we put in contact information for our neighbors. We maybe add a contingency plan or mop up procedures. So we add some of those things and we can kind of go look through like a burn plan. So this is a burn plan. I like using this template. It's from 2008 in RCS. It's got all the standard information in there. There's the landowner name, address, what's our objective, maintain grassland diversity and productivity. Um, and then some of the stuff is just kind of fill in the blank. Who's the fire boss? Um, it says here, attach a map of fire break locations, wind direction, fire in sequence, water sources, access points. And then the types and condition dimensions of the fire break. So this is where we put in what type of fire break we have. Um, you know, 30 foot wide mode fire break, bailed off, shredded around as well. And then the procedures used to confine the fire break within the boundary. Uh, here's where we would employ um, you know, ring fire technique, uh, lighting the backfire off a wet line let it back burn about five feet, then proceed igniting strip head fires, increasing size of downwind black. You get the point. So basically you spell that out in there. Uh, some of these things can be copy and pasted if you do multiple burns, pretty easy to do. Uh, this contingency plan on this is fairly um, generic and you, know, you can add more stuff to it if you want. There's a section about smoke management, uh, how many hours of ignition, what kind of smoke dispersal you need, things of that nature. Then here's where we would add our equipment. You know, we got two 200 gallon pumper units. We need four drip torches, one kestrel. We need 10 gallons of drip torch mix. You know, all the equipment that we're gonna need throughout the day. Then this one also has on here, what kind of Burn protection do we need for certain things? You know, is there any utility poles that we need to have, you know, weed eated around or burned out around? Do we need to move any um, deer blinds or anything like that, or any hay bales, anything like that? And then here's where we, where we put our crew names and responsibilities. So when we initially put together a plan, we don't put together in our plan, we don't put specific people who's going to be doing these because most of the times we don't know who's going to be doing these jobs until they actually show up the day of. So we actually just put the positions that we actually need. And then projected dates, uh, mine, I put January 1st to December 31st, you know, year long. I don't limit, limit myself. Uh, my fire chief in this district only likes me to make sure the fire is lit between the times of 9 to 6 p.m. Uh, as long as it's lit before 6 p.m., they're fine, but they want it burned um, lit during those hours. And then here's where we add our wind, relative humidity, air temperature. They've added 
sections in here about fire break moisture, burn moisture, the amount of fine fuels out there in the fire break and burn. You can add that stuff in there. But again, you know, the one thing here about the wind, humidity, and temperature, don't put yourself into a hole and narrow yourself. So make sure you write, you know, as wide a prescription as you can to still consider and meet your objectives. So in this case, you know, I had 20 to 60% humidity, five to 20 mile an hour wind, and 50 degrees, 90 degrees. Now, when you write a prescription like this, the biggest thing is it's your top end of your prescription. That's when you're going to get into trouble. If you're burning, you know, if I had in here that I'm burning at 50 degrees and we started it when it's 45, that's not going to be an issue. But if I had put 90 degrees and it was burning 100 degrees, that's when those is when those become an issue. And then here's where you put your joining landowners, fire department, contact information, oil and gas, whatever it may be. And then here's the map that we put together. It's a really basic map, right? We've identified the burn unit. We've identified fire breaks, got wind direction. We got the vegetation surrounding the burn unit. Uh, we've got water source identified. We have a couple access site access points identified on here. And then you also notice I've got these what we call drop points along the, the edges. And we use these to basically communicate to the burn boss and crew boss about relative position when we're burning. So, you know, I could say, hey, we're about to point D or drop point D. Um, we're going to sit here and hold, you know, while maybe, you know, H or whatever works to G or something like that. So it's a really simple, easy burn map to put together. You could just print off a copy on Google and write this stuff in. The big thing is make sure you do like a key down at the bottom so people know, you know, what you're trying to describe, like, you know, what an access point is. Now you can get much more fancy of this and we do all the time because we have professional software that we use to write burn plans with. And again, I would direct you, um, I direct you to the webinar that we just did a couple weeks ago on writing burn plans. Another map that I really like to write or put together is a locator map of where the unit is relative to a landmark. So this would be to town. Um, so in case the local fire department, um, you know, would need to know where it's at relative to town, it makes it pretty easy for them to, uh, to locate. So Briefly touch on conservation programs. So if you're interested in applying fire to your land, um, there are a lot of different programs out there uh, that you can get assistance with, cost share, uh, not only putting the fire together, but also like maybe cutting trees prior to, uh, deferring your grasslands or your rangelands. There is EQIP through NRCS, uh, Fezzes Forever has a bunch of programs, uh, Pathways, the Grassland Improvement Program. We have all these different programs available for people to, to utilize to put fire on the ground. And, and my, my main advice here is to make sure you contact your local resource professional for your assistance. So we got farm bill biologists uh, through Pheasants Forever all across the country. Uh, state game commissions uh, have private lands biologists throughout the states. Uh, every county, most every county has local NRCS offices that you can reach out and get assistance from as well from them. So the other thing that I want to quickly say about conservation programs is that if you're under a, a federal, state, or local contract, make sure you're following the guidelines about when you're burning. Most have some restrictions uh, due to some, uh, some rules, you know, about migratory birds or nesting season or what have you. And so here in Nebraska, that is typically May 1st to July 15th. Um, it's kind of an old outdated, you know, guidelines about, you know, burning when we're burning and stuff like that. Um, but that's the current rules kind of set in place. So typically we're not burning during those dates, um, at least if you're in one of those programs. So be sure to check with your local program manager 
about, about those restriction dates. And there may be other restriction dates. You know, there could be other restrictions from like threatened endangered species, things of that nature that you may need to, to look into as well. 